You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, back in New York City. And this is Prashant Parmaswaran from Washington, D.C. How are you doing today, Prashant? Good. How are you doing? Doing good. It's good to be back. I've been uh, traveling quite a bit recently, so it's good to be back in uh, New York to uh, talk to you about uh, the latest developments uh, in in the Asia Pacific region on geopolitics. Uh, so I've been having, uh, I've been getting a lot of messages from listeners uh, asking for a podcast about this topic. So certainly uh, this would have been something we'd have covered anyways. Uh, but the recent election results in Sri Lanka are on a lot of people's minds. Uh, certainly in conversations about geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, So for listeners that weren't necessarily keeping up with Sri Lanka or don't keep up with Sri Lanka, uh, just on uh, November 16th, uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, the country's former uh, defense secretary uh, under his brother Mahinda Rajapaksa, who uh, oversaw the end of the end of the civil war, among other things, and uh, had a, a highly authoritarian turn under his uh, tenure of uh, of 10 years from 2005 to 2015. Uh, so his younger brother, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, uh, won the elections for president and was sworn in. The former president, Metripat Sirisena, who sort of ousted uh, Rajapaksa by surprise in January 2015, uh, did not run for re-election. Uh, so this was pretty much uh, whoever was coming into office was going to be a new uh, prime minister, um, and just and just by way of background, I think I think there's a few other things that are important for setting the context for today's conversation. So uh, Sri Lanka has been going through quite a bit uh, over the past uh, 13 months or so. So uh, last October to around mid-December, the country was mired in a major constitutional crisis. Uh, we talked about that. We did a whole podcast uh, on on that at the time. So if listeners are interested in more granular detail about what exactly happened, I recommend going back to that or, or reading any number of articles we had at The Diplomat covering the issue. But basically, um, the so Sri Lanka has both a president and a prime minister, and Maitripal Sirisena, uh, who's the president formerly, um, decided basically that he would um, appoint Mahinda Rajapaksa, the former president and current prime minister, uh, prime minister at the time. I know it's a little little confusing to keep all these characters straight if you're not familiar with the names. Uh, that that created an odd situation in Sri Lanka where the country effectively had two prime ministers because uh, Ronald Wickram Singh was also the prime minister, leading to a prolonged standoff with the courts and the legislature, eventually leading to a reversion to the situation, um, status quo ante, where Mahinda Rajapaksa stepped down from the prime ministership. Uh, so that was one big development that took place uh, last year. The other one was this year's uh, terrible um, April Easter Sunday uh, terror attacks, which killed more than 250 people. Uh, Prashant and I again did a podcast about that and the uh, implications for the uh, Islamic State's presence in the region. Uh, the Islamic State didn't directly carry out the attack, but it was a regional organization that had pledged allegiance uh, to the Islamic State. And uh, the targets included... Um, minorities, um, ordinary Sri Lankans, foreigners uh, all around the country. There were a series of coordinated bombings. And after that happens, uh, just days after that happens, uh, uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, the former defense minister with a reputation for being sort of uh, a a security-minded person, uh, decides that he will announce his run for president. He'd sort of been laying the groundwork for that run um, for some weeks prior to uh, those attacks, certainly, where he had... Uh, among other things, renounced his U.S. citizenship. He was an American citizen uh, for a while before he um, denaturalized and uh, prepared to run for the presidency. And then finally, um, the Rajapaksa has made a bet that the Sri Lankan public after the Easter Sunday attacks would want the return of a a sort of strongman authoritarian style leadership, uh, especially the country's uh, Sinhalese majority. Um, Both uh, both Rajapaksa brothers are seen as sort of hard hardcore Sinhala nationalists, and we and here we are now. Uh, Gotabaya has been sworn in amid uh, concerns from the country's minority groups, uh, human rights group, uh, uh, human rights groups around the world uh, about a potential turn away from uh, peace and reconciliation talks that have been happening in Sri Lanka. Although not really, if you uh, if you ask some people, uh, the, the previous government wasn't necessarily taking things too seriously. Um, but that's all a bit of background. Uh, and Prashant, you know, the the Rajapaksas have quite a legacy when it comes to geopolitics in the region. Um, how do you think? How do you think this election is going to be viewed or is being viewed right now in uh, New Delhi? Certainly, one of the countries with the biggest geopolitical stakes in the Indian Ocean region, uh, where Sri Lanka is located. 
Yeah, I think you you laid out the context uh, uh, very well, both both domestically and internationally. I think I think the big question for this will be since we're seeing uh, essentially the Rajapaksa is coming back to power. You know, how much of this will represent continuity with respect to their previous uh, time in government, and how much change might we see? And I, I think in the in the foreign relations component of that, uh, the big sort of question is um, to the extent that we saw under the Rajapaksa as a, a little bit of a tilt uh, by Sri Lanka towards China that caused India to be a little bit more anxious, uh, you know, incidents, you know, any number of incidents, whether it came to infrastructure projects or, you know, Chinese submarines uh, showing up in the Indian Ocean and, and Sri Lanka that the Indians were very concerned about. This definitely for for New Delhi presents a challenge in terms of how they're, they're engaging. Um, although, I would just say the big sort of geopolitical question is, you know, to what extent uh, might we see change given the fact that we're seeing not only change within Sri Lanka, but also the changing regional security environment, right? So if we're going to take this from the perspective of the Rajapaksas having governed from 2005 to 2015, in the last four or five years, we've seen a number of changes taking place. The, the, the U.S.-China uh, rivalry dynamic has changed significantly. Um, in part due to the stance that the Trump administration has taken. The conversation on the Indo-Pacific has has heated up, and Sri Lanka is seen as a, as a pivotal player in the in the Indo-Pacific region. So, you know, I, I think the big question, and you're already seeing uh, Godabaya Rajapaksa trying to get ahead of this, you know, in some of his, his comments since he took office and interviews sort of saying, you know, Sri Lanka wants to really be equidistant and wants to be neutral in this sort of game of major powers. We're not seeking to lean towards India or China. Um, but I think the, the big question will be, you know, how challenging is it for Sri Lanka to do that um, in the wake of this sort of growing major power competition and this this whole conversation about the Indian Ocean and the regional environment? It's going to be very difficult to stay clear of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think what you're getting at is that it's uh, certainly early days to tell uh, how how the Rajapaksas are going to steer Sri Lanka uh, in into this new period. Uh, you know, I I wrote an article just the day after the election, uh, looking at the election manifesto of the SLPP, uh, the Rajapaksas party. Um, and what was interesting is that that manifesto actually included some um, some language that I I describe as nationalist when it comes to something like Hambantota, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Hamantota is obviously the poster child for uh, Belt and Road Initiative, quote, debt trap diplomacy uh, amid Sri Lanka's inability to service the debt for the strategically located port. The country had to conduct a debt equity swap with China, where the Chinese company that had built and manages the port was given um, was basically given the port on a on a 99 year lease. Uh, so. You know, people have called it neo-colonialism. People have called it uh, debt trap diplomacy or sort of strategic debt trap diplomacy. That this was China's intention all along to bring Sri Lanka into loans that can't be serviced. Um, but what's interesting is that in the election manifesto, uh, Hamantota Port is defined as quote a national asset. And mm -hmm. um, so this is the quote from the manifesto. Hamantota Port is a national asset and was defined as a strategic asset by us previously. And the intention was never to sell or lease the port for 99 years. We will make it a priority to revisit the already signed agreement with the Chinese government and explore ways as to how best we could bring about a win-win for the two countries. Uh, so here again, I mean, it's it's early days. We haven't really seen follow-up on this point just yet. Um, but what's interesting is that if, if the Rajapaksas do intend to keep a more equidistant foreign policy, we might see go to buy a Rajapaksa become, you know, the latest string of um, among the latest string of leaders after an election in the Indo-Pacific region. Other examples being Imran Khan in Pakistan, uh, Mahathir mm -hmm. in Malaysia, to uh, question some of their predecessors' uh, agreements with China. Of course, Hamad the uh, the original um, deal to actually allow China access was was done under Mahinda Rajapaksa. Uh, it was a Siri Sena who oversaw the conversion of that deal uh, when it became unserviceable to the 99-year lease. Um, but now, you know, Sri Lanka, I think, is having certain uh, regrets about that. And of course, there have been popular protests in the region as well. And what's interesting, too, is that in the in the election, um, Gotabaya's main opponent in the presidential elections, there were over 30 candidates, uh, but his main opponent was uh, Sajid uh, Pramadasa, who actually mm -hmm. is the member of parliament for Hamantota, and Gotabaya actually took this um, took that district uh, in, in the presidential election. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how the nationalism uh, aspect of of this upcoming term of the Rajapaksas manifests with regard to something like Hamantota. 
Um, what's your what's your expectation for how uh, you know Sri Lanka might deal specifically with Hambantota, but also more broadly speaking with its position in China's Indian Ocean outreach and diplomacy, including through the Belt and Road? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the Hambantota example is is definitely one that um, you know we've seen not only uh, within Sri Lanka and South Asia, but just really internationally. I think it's become the case that you know has spotlighted uh, some of China's activities um, and also being tied to sort of some of its other initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative and what the Chinese are doing in in, in these various countries. I I think there there are sort of two aspects to that 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 seem interesting. One is. Um, with respect to these leaders that you've mentioned, whether it's you know Mahathir Mohammed or, or Imran Khan, there is an aspect of sort of renegotiating or recalibrating uh, the relationship with China and some of these projects. But it, it seems like you know for most of these instances, it's more due to domestic political realignments rather than any sort of strategic uh, shift. And so I think that will kind of be the broader conversation, which is that to what extent uh, is the Rajapaksa government's approach to whether it's countries or particular projects, how much of that is, is really strategic and how much of that is just sort of, you know, wanting to actually get past what the previous government has been doing, as you indicated. And I think the other aspect of that is, um, I, I think there is a little bit, you know, in, in New Delhi and other capitals as well, um, in so much as there is concern about what the Chinese are doing in these projects, there's also a sense of, um, you know, these countries, uh, whether it's Sri Lanka, you know, Malaysia, Pakistan, they they look for assistance from countries, including China, but they also look at various powers depending on what is available to them. And I think that's the bigger uh, question because, you know, Sri Lanka will view what China offers relative to what it can get from India, relative to what it can get from, you know, even Western countries like the United States. And, and there's that's where I think I see, you know, another interesting angle there um, with respect to some of the previous, you know, human rights and democracy issues that the Rajapaksas have faced in Sri Lanka. You know, how will that affect Sri Lanka's ties to Western countries, and in, including the United States, where, in fact, you know, in the last few years, we've actually seen some uh, increases in terms of engagement between the United States and Sri Lanka under a different government. Uh, you know, if we start to see some of these domestic measures that are a little bit concerning for the United States, you know, that are authoritarian in nature or uh, issues of human rights violations, you know, to what extent might that affect engagement with Western countries and then lead Sri Lanka to tilt once again towards China? Because that doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's a balance of alignments, right? Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point. Um, actually, I think I think that's going to be something to watch uh, because as part of not only the American free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, but also in Tokyo, uh, where I just was for a week talking mm -hmm. about some of these issues, including the Sri Lankan election with a few Japanese officials. Uh, the view very much is that, you know, Sri Lanka is going to be an important case for how much, uh, you know, the free and open coalition, so to speak, uh, you know, India, uh, Japan, Australia, the United States, um, some other countries around the region, um, maybe even the European countries, uh, how much they can offer to entice a country like Sri Lanka to uh, pursue, you know, self-interested uh, economic uh, projects with um, that that don't necessarily have to involve China. Because you're right. I mean, in the 2005 to 2015 period when Mahinda Rajapaksa was in power, uh, China really was the main source of a lot of this financing. I mean, this was before the Belt and Road, largely. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, China was the main source of easy fun easy financing for a lot of these countries that were looking to get uh, a bunch of projects underway. And of course, you know, there were other issues, including uh, corruption and and sort of um, pursuing projects with lower standards, which I think if, if Sri Lanka is going to look for financing from countries like uh, the United States and Japan, it might have more of a higher bar to cross there. Uh, but I think that's something to watch for uh, is uh, how how uh, Sri Lanka can balance its ties by actually pursuing uh, the kinds of uh, financing needs that it has from um, from Western countries uh, and and countries like Japan. Uh, in Tokyo, I think, you know, Gotabaya's election was viewed, uh, at least in a couple of the conversations I had, as a negative development for Japan because mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lanka, um, as part of Japan's uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, there had been a lot of outreach, and including on the military side, actually, between the Maritime Self-Defense Force, too, and uh, and the Sri Lankan government under uh, Maitri Palatsiri Sena. So uh, I think there are concerns that Sri Lanka will will sort of turn back into its its previous um, self, where it privileges China in its foreign affairs. But again, you know, as I think we've been discussing, a lot remains open to questioning right now. Um, you know, what's, what's been interesting, too, is to see how New Delhi decided to play 
the pre-election run-up this time. Um, you know, they sort of kept quiet largely and watched what was happening. Uh, I mean, in the Indian Ocean, that seems to be India's go-to strategy, right? I mean, sometimes things pay off for you, like in the Maldives last year when um, Abdullah Yamin, the authoritarian um, leader who had taken that island country away from um, away from the United States, uh, sorry, away from India, uh, was uh, ousted and uh, Ibu Soli was elected. So uh, that seems to be India's sort of new uh, go-to approach here. Yeah, I think the Indian outreach has, has been notable, uh, you know, both in terms of the the pre-election outreach as well as the post-election outreach, just to make sure that uh, India is getting ahead of these developments and, and is being seen as active and doing its own part with respect to Sri Lanka. But I think, you know, as you correctly noted with respect to these various examples we've seen in the Indo-Pacific, um, whether it's Malaysia or Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka or Pakistan, I think it, it is important to remember, you know, we always emphasize on this podcast, these smaller countries do have their own agency. So how they are able to shape these alignments that they have with major powers. And then also, you know, the other interesting thing that I'm interested to see with respect to Sri Lanka is, you know, for example, how it uses some of its regional uh, mechanisms, multilateralism, minilateralism, to try and, you know, give a little bit more space for the country to engage. So, you know, for example, Sri Lanka is the chair of the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral uh, Technical and Economic Cooperation, BIMSTEC, right, which has been the sort of um, you know, it's been a little bit dormant in the last few years in terms of where it's supposed to be. But, you know, India's and, and other countries have shown, you know, indications of trying to revive it as a mechanism for engaging in sort of broader Indian Ocean cooperation. So what what can Sri Lanka do on its own terms to shape its own future and destiny as an Indo-Pacific uh, power and Indo-Pacific entity in its own right? I, I think that's another uh, example to see. And of course, uh, you know, as you pointed out, with respect to the the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka, we always have to keep in mind, as much as we're talking about expected developments, there are always these unexpected developments that can help shape the future of these countries. So, how Sri Lanka and the and the Rajapaksa government uh, navigate unexpected developments, I think I suspect will be quite key as well. Yeah, no, absolutely, I uh, completely agree with that. Uh, I think I think you've uh, laid out a, a good set of things to kind of uh, keep our eyes on uh, going mm-hmm. forward with Sri Lanka. I don't think this is going to be the last podcast by any means on on, on this country that has been really at the center of many um, many geopolitical conversations from the Belt and Road to the Indo-Pacific strategy to the broader significance of the Indian Ocean region. Uh, so I'm sure we'll be coming back uh, to Sri Lanka soon. Uh, but yeah, Prashanta, thanks a lot for joining me this week. Yeah, good to be with you. Great. Uh, and for our American listeners, of course, uh, happy Thanksgiving. It is going to be a little bit of a calmer week. Uh, well, so we hope, unless, uh, I don't know, the North Koreans launch missiles or something like that happens. Anyways, um, we'll be back next week with more. Uh, but before we close out, just a note, uh, if you have been a subscriber to the podcast, but you haven't yet left us a review, please do that. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Spotify, or any not- other number of podcast providers. And if you've been a subscriber for a while, Uh, or sorry, if you've been a listener for a while, but you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you do that so you can keep up with future episodes. And just before we finish, a quick note from our sponsor of this episode of the Asia Geopolitics Podcast is brought to you by Diplomat Risk Intelligence, or DRI. DRI is the consulting and analysis division of the Diplomat, the Asia Pacific's leading current affairs magazine. Since its launch in 2002, The Diplomat has been dedicated to quality analysis and commentary on events and trends in Asia and around the world, and is now one of the most respected publications covering the region. DRI inherits this approach and offers clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors worldwide access to an exclusive network of subject matter experts and analysts. Whatever your needs in the wider Asia-Pacific region, DRI can offer the knowledge and expertise necessary to anticipate and manage geopolitical and geoeconomic risks. For more information, please visit dri.thediplomat.com. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back next week with more.